Hello there. My name's Linda France and I'm recording this from my home near Stagshaw, not far from the ghost of Hadrian's Wall. I'm going to be reading some poems on the festival's theme of kindness. Lately, scholars have suggested that Darwin got it wrong and human evolution has less to do with the survival of the fittest and is more a story of survival of the kindest. We develop better through community and cooperation, working and growing together. The American poet Galway Cannell wrote that the secret title of every good poem should be tenderness. And I like the idea that poetry is a place where we can be tender, like in a garden, by the sea, or in a comfortable room where we feel safe. Over the past year, haven't we all become aware of how important those places are and come to appreciate how much kindness matters, how it holds us all together, like kin, one word tucked inside another? You're going to be hearing a lot about spring, gardens, plants and birds over the next 30 minutes or so. If you pay close attention to the natural world, you can't help but be kind. You quickly see how everything is connected to everything else. So I thought a good place to start would be with a song that touches on those ideas. It's a poem of mine, beautifully set and sung by Joshua Green, called The Cuckoo and the Egg. Inside the cuckoo's call of spring inside the ear of spring the swaying reed inside the swaying reed the warbler's nest inside the warbler's nest the cuckoo's egg inside the cuckoo's egg the eye of gold inside the eye of gold the top of the sun Inside the tug of the sun, the birds wing. Cuckoo, cuckoo, calling over and over. Inside the birds' wings, five thousand miles. Inside five thousand miles, the vast Sahara. Inside the vast Sahara. African sun Inside the African sun The hunger for young Inside the hunger for young Earth greening Inside the earth greening The heart sap Inside the heart sap The cuckoo calling Cuckoo, cuckoo calling Over and over While we're with birds in the springtime, I'm going to read my poem about the dawn chorus, all the birds waking up together and singing. Dawn Chorus While the plough's still hard at work, churning clouds, clouds Turner would have loved, moody, fat, a tawny owl set on clocking off, Strings of silence plucked, the sound of a heart breaking like glass. Cue to lift the lid of the dark forest of this fairy tale we live. Here we sit like old pagans looking at the sky as if it were a god 
dividing night from day. 4am and all we can hear is the stir of the wind, held breath, earth not ready to exhale yet. This is the life we normally sleep through, don't hear for the boil and prowl of our own minds. But the red birds of morning begin to claim their territory. The restless owl closes a door, crying out for a drop of oil, the rent air tacked back together with song. Up on their perches, invisible birds buzz with the wake-up call of hormone and instinct, jostling for longest, loudest, limberest. Listen to me, listen to me. I'm alive, alive. Something to boast about after the long night's fasting. Our first bird, a robin, early riser, fierce defender. Soon the song thrush piping his two notes, blackbird rinsing his golden beak, polishing the ring round his eye. Necessary to give voice to this yearning to live and love and have your children survive. 425, something different happens, an incohate elating. In strikes the first warbler, our northern nightingale, the black cap. All the threads of sound spinning now in a net around us. We are enchanted, words fail us, we are all ears, caught in the net, not knowing if what we're hearing is spaces or strings. We are liquid, our edges melting into music, till we lose our eyeness and we are song. Our little flock huddle, warm hands round cups of tea in the chill of what still doesn't qualify as morning. The trilling and calling, squeaking and fluting, crashes in from all directions, so the whole body is tender to it, our core touched by it. A wood pigeon's aching purr, distant falsetto. This is the way you always wanted to begin the day, met and held, lifted back into yourself after the long nights forgetting a small interstice of feeling lost so you can fall into finding why you're bone alive again. The erotics of ornithology, living through the senses all the way to rapture, joy. An hour of nothing else between your ears and you can't stop grinning mouth widening to make more room for all this glory, all this life for its own sake. 5.40, nothing short of radiance, sun rising above an elusive horizon, splashing trees, walls, you with gold, loud and sharp as the birds singing, so they become its guardians, mystic visitants, spirits of the day. Pheasant and wagtail, great tit and chiffchaff, gold crest and wren, little wren who weighs less than a 50p piece, tree creeper, blue tit and missile thrush with his football rattle, an onomatopoeia of feathered things that Emily Dickinson, dressed all in white, heard as hope, vowel and plosive, a gesture, a giving of lips and throat, how we learn to talk after all, by imitating these birds, borrowing their beauty, bringing our very selves to light. And so we hear the compass of our own hearts, tinsel and workshop, too many yeses to count. According to Emily, find ecstasy in life, the mere sense of living, joy enough. Turning it up, turning it up, 
us all, ratchet and core. One way of looking at kindness is as a process that we might cultivate, learn and dwell in. And an image for that in this next poem is a bowl. It considers the potter's art, making something out of clay from earth, something that stands for the whole world. Bowl. Heavy, cold, dark, what the earth knows of itself, I sweeten with water. Watch it soften, cohere, lean into a new smoothness, the deep courage of form. Whose hand is coaxing, easing clod into circle, hand answering hand? Together we are making a hemisphere, a map of the sky, known and unknown, caught in the lip of what fire will teach me to call bowl, a vessel that will crack and be mended, crack and be mended, always empty, even when I fill it full of whatever light there is, shadow full. That continuous process of repair reminds me of a wonderful quotation from the Saint Lucian poet Derek Walcott that I used as an epigraph to my second collection, The Gentleness of the Very Tall. It goes like this. Break a vase and the love that reassembles the fragments is stronger than that love which took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. The glue that fits the pieces is the ceiling of its original shape. It's a bit like the Japanese art of kintsugi, where precious pieces of ceramic are mended with molten gold, not to hide the cracks, but draw attention to them and celebrate the beauty and richness of brokenness. This is an idea that returns a little in the awareness of vulnerability in my next poem, Dreaming the Real. Sometimes kindness isn't available to us. We can't even be kind to ourselves. And so we feel contracted and isolated. But when the shadow has passed, we can come back into a kinder, more connected relationship with ourselves and the world again. Dreaming the Real I'm lying down, looking at the colour of sky, falling through trees, dreaming the real, tasting what it feels like to love it. Why did it take me so long to let go, simply exhale, so the day could breathe itself in and open without me standing in the way? How could I forget the grace of my own body, Strong as this blue, tender as the white of the wild blossom, warm as midday light. Let me practice a patience bold enough to hold every weather, trusting the elements, the beauty of rain, all its shades of grey. I want whatever's real to be enough. At least it's a place to begin and to master the art of loving it, feel it love me back under my skin. There are more birds in this next poem, which contains a visit into Newcastle around the time last year when the swallows were gathering to fly back to Africa and for a brief spell between lockdowns there was a sense of things being on the move again. Flight of the swallows. Count 17 swallows on the wire as you open and close the farm gate. 
Seventeen swallows don't make a flock, but beaks lifted to the late sun, they queue for their tickets south. You'll miss them when they go, breaking the nets they've spun round your roof this watchful summer. Drive east, slowly. Two seasons have passed since you were last in the city. The streets are flocked. There's nothing that isn't human or man-made except the sky. Outside m &S, two girls sing, holding mics as if they were on TV. Their voices, birdsong. You'll miss them when you go. All day the sky is reliably blue. May we all fly in the kindest direction. I thought I'd read a couple of poems that took us somewhere else, seeing as most of us are missing travelling days out further afield or across the water to other countries. Like many of us in this part of the world, I really enjoy crossing to the island of Lindisfarne when the tides allow. My next poem looks at one of the flowers that grows there, a coastal plant called silverweed. It has many different common and traditional names which I mention in the poem. Our Lord's Footsteps, Sankfoil, Goosewort, Richette. Its botanical name is Argentina and Serena. The early Christian monastic tradition associated with Lindisfarne recalled my friendship with a Buddhist monk who occasionally sends me photographs of plants he sees on his travels. Once he sent me a photograph of some silverweed and its long red runners, little yellow flowers and curling silvery leaves reminded me of the illuminated Gospels. So I wrote this poem for him in appreciation of his kindness and wisdom. Lindisfarne, Silverweed You send me a pilgrim monk's eye view our Lord's footsteps, sank foil, gold and silver, sprung out of the sand, foliage like feathers, spray. Crimson runners are lines on a manuscript, join what needs to be joined, arteries of earth and heart. The shudder of the sea not far away, a sadness in the stretch and snap of the waves, the way they suck themselves back, sadder. You steer your course with such grace. A brother's footsteps I try to follow and ask for nothing, amazed when what blooms in the imprint of each carefully planted heel and toe is a sudden illumination of silver and gold, a chance for the mutual, that amniotic salt we've been birthed in over and over. All I need to do is open the book of my heart and keep on looking. Here, traveller, goosewort, richette, Tuck some fresh leaves inside your shoes to leaven the crossing, our long walking. Ten years ago, I was lucky enough to be able to tour some of the world's botanical gardens as research for my poetry collection, Reading the Flowers. The first garden I visited is the oldest botanical garden in the world that's still on its original site. It's in Padua in northern Italy. I travelled there in late September, early October, when it was still very warm, much warmer than back in Northumberland, and I was completely enchanted. If you haven't been, it's set between two cathedrals, St Anthony and St Justina, and throughout the day, inside the garden, you can hear the bells ringing for the different offices. These old walled gardens, the Hortus Conclusus 
mentioned in the poem, were thought to be emanations of the body of the Virgin Mary, one of the kindest, safest places you could ever find yourself. This is the oldest garden in the world. Auto Botanico di Padova. Hortus Conclusus, our mother's garden. A roof of blue silk, medicine for the eyes. Her photosynthesis, given and giving back. The space between your arms conceives a circle. Saint Anthony and Justina call to each other across spires of magnolia, the tired fountains, minutiae of gravel. Time slips away and we shuck off our unnecessary selves. Let them hang, draped on the railings, while we dance like these fruits of the Havenia, more or less human. Our partners, Japanese anemones, ruby moon, the hyacinth bean. After rain, the tang of tamped dust, and your heart translates into folia opening, five hundred years old, still unfinished. I'm going to end with a blessing for all of us who might need a little more kindness just now. It was written with one person in particular in mind, but it can apply to all of us at some point, particularly now, after such a difficult year and on the threshold of the new, the unknown, at the beginning of spring. The plant I use to figure this poem and create a healing space is the hawthorn, May, one of my favourite plants, Crotagus monogyna, sacred to the goddess, and so historically considered dangerous. But it's a plant that teaches us how to stop, to honour life and death, and breathe in kindness, not forgetting the balm of birdsong. So, thank you very much for listening. Stay well as you go about the rest of your day. This is for you, and it's hall medicine, Crotagus monogyna. Because there are days, and more often nights, when words aren't enough, and the ones we find uncurling from our minds or lips fail to take root, I want to plant you a hedge of hawthorn. Named from Kratos, strength, it brings the singular gift of pitching the hardest grain against the softest petal. I offer you this. Settle back and rest. Watch the black stems spring into bud, leaf. A film that captures time. Tick, tick, then releases it. Let the precious blossom, clusters of sex and death, waft their hag-blessed musk and take you as they will. A spell to blow the dust off your winter skin. What's buried under it, shy of the lifting light. May the riddle of thorn keep you from harm. Remind you of home. Someone, somewhere, whose job it is to take you in. Those open arms, strong enough to bear whatever fruit tastes good to birds and us, waxwing and thrush. <laughs>